Hey, Rich, how are you? Good. Thanks for uh, coming early morning on. morning over there, right? Yeah, it's uh, early morning. Um, it's evening for you, right? Yes, yes. In Ho Chi Minh City, it's uh, 11 o'clock, 11 p.m. What's your schedule like these days? Uh, usually, I'm try I'm usually retiring about this time on the weekend, on the weekdays. Uh, I have a uh, full schedule all week, mostly dealing with school. Oh, okay. Are you teaching um, now? I'm doing or? both now. So I'm, I've just entered a graduate program in industrial fine arts uh, as a way of getting another degree, but also improving my Vietnamese. The degree is taught entirely in Vietnamese. So I'm concurrently taking Vietnamese classes in order to understand the lectures. That's intense. I think we're definitely going to need to get into that. But uh, sure. you started out uh, early on out of high school joining the U.S. Army? I did. Um, I always wanted to go to college or university. And I come from a, my adoptive family is a working class family. So as with many working class families, education usually isn't the priority. Right. Uh, also, we, did, we didn't have the money. So in order to have a chance at seeing the inside of a classroom, I joined the Army and I got the GI Bill and the Army College Fund. How which old? Pay for it. How old were you at the time? I enlisted when I was uh, 17 and when I was 18, I went in. So directly after high school. Did your so at seventeen, your mom and dad had to sign a waiver. Uh, I, I I'm trying to recall, but I think so. I I, I did some pre enlistment thing. Yeah, I uh, I joined the Marine Corps at seventeen as well, and my mom and yeah. dad had to sign a consent form because I was under eighteen. Right. I just turned seventeen at the time. Why did you join? Um, probably for the same reason. Yeah, we, you know, my brother and I both did, and I don't think we yeah. had. I don't think we had a, well, I know we didn't have a direction. We weren't college bound. We weren't great mm -hmm. students. I think yeah. my mom and dad wanted us to become priests. So, um, uh, you know, in order to get away from all that, I think, you know, Tom and I joined, but yeah. So they, they signed my consent and, um, uh, you know, this is back in 93. Yeah. Right. So, that, well, that's when I, that's when I, when, when I got out. Oh, wow. So I, just, so I, I joined in 1990. So you're a lot. I, I went in. Oh, you're a few years older than I am. I am. Tom, Tom's old. Tom's my age, I think, right? Well, he's 46 now. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, you're, oh, you're older than you? us. I'm 45. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we're going back to a question later on about baby lift. I was actually yeah. before that. We'll, we'll get to that. Wonderful. So, yeah, so what was your uh, your MOS, or I'm not sure what they call it in the Army? I was 11 Bravo. I think it's uniform throughout all the services, the MOS. Which yeah, is 11 Bravo, it's infantry, yeah, okay, yeah. 1101, 1103 is, I think, um, military, I mean, on, on the Marine side, it's uh, oh, okay. infantry, okay. yeah. 1100. If I, I had to choose, I wouldn't have done that again. What would you have done? I would have, I would have liked to do something where I would probably use my brain a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and have some, I don't know, some early education, but being how, a grunt. Against my but how do we know these things when we're that young, right? I know. And when you're young, you're like, I just want to be really gung ho about it and just test myself and do the hardest thing. And mm -hmm. I regretted that though. I, I, I should have used my mind. And that was four years of um, being an uh, It was three years, just, just over three years. And, and the strange thing, when I went in, uh, I want. I hadn't been to Asia before, so I signed up to be based in Honolulu. In, in, I think it was somewhere in Hawaii for the 25th Infantry. And um, the U.S. hadn't been in a conflict since Grenada, but as soon as I was in basic training at Fort Benning, Go I activated Kuwait, and it was over. Oh, once you got to Kuwait, it was over, or no? Well, well, you know, it was like. I went in thinking, oh, it, it, we were having this, like, it's going to be peacetime for, you know, my whole enlistment. I should have known. But, uh, yes, once I was in basic, um, already in basic training, the, uh, the Gulf War started. And I was like, oh, I'm screwed. I just signed on the dotted line. and I'm Yeah. What was that like for you in the 90s? Uh, I, was the, I mean, that's the start of the 90s. What was it like as an Asian um, adopted kid um, joining? The U.S. military. Well, it's a little strange. Um, well, first of all, there's not a lot of Asians 
in the military, as far as I was able to see firsthand. Um, but, but my adoptive family is a military family. Uh, my grandfather was in for like 26 years. So, um, and, and my uncle had gone to Vietnam and then returned. So I think it wasn't so strange about joining the military from the family side. Um, being in there, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's very strange when you watch Vietnam Hollywood movies, war movies with your, with your buddies, and they're really racist. But in the end of the day, you, you've got to still suck it up and, and be there for them, and they've got to be there for you. So a lot of those things, um, it was a really, it was an early education for me about, you know, more of a real world. And did you, were there, was there racism um, directed towards you at the time? Yeah, indirectly. I mean, I, I never really got really bothered by it, to be honest. Um, I figured it was just part of the game because, you yeah. It's so racist and so sexist all over that I didn't think I was being necessarily Bingo singled now. out. I mean, for example, when we had to do push-ups, you know, you normally count like one drill sergeant, two drill sergeant. I had to say wax on, wax off, which is racist. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's really racist. But, I mean, their job is to kind of like dehumanize you. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I just thought it was a part of, whatever I had to go through to get through it. You know, this is something I talk to my wife about all the time. Um, mm -hmm. This hazing, this idea of hazing and how far you mm -hmm. go with it. You know, um, mm -hmm. guys like us coming from a military background in the nineties, you know, they put, they put hands on you, you know? Um, yeah. I was stretching one time on, on a, on a, you know, in boot camp, and I wasn't going according to the directions of the platoon. And I was like, I had my hands on the bed and I was stretching my calves and all of a sudden I hear a whack on my back and I look down and my t-shirts ripped off with my drill sergeant and he grabs really? me by the back of the neck. Yeah. And he just like push, you know, he pushes me down and, and I'm, you know, makes me do push ups. but that's the kind of violence and hazing that, you know, you go through in the nineties and obviously they, I don't know if, if they could have done that. I, I was never touched. I mean, I might've been pushed, but I've never been really like manhandled. Um, I don't know. Maybe the Marines are a bit different. No, the Marines, yeah. It was, def it was yeah. a lot more brutal, but it was, yeah. you know, when I look back on it, I'm like, uh, a lot of us went through that at the time and it just sort of made us who we are. And I like the, what you brought up about this whole, um, you didn't feel like it, you, you were singled out because it was really, everything's made to break us down. But I understand right. the construct today, how different things are. I think the optics of, of how, this racism is perceived today is 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 it is a genuine concern. Uh, right. It's a real life thing, um, but I think we were so programmed uh, back then to be oh it's okay it's not a problem it's just you know but today it's just not it's it's really we're, we're so much more aware right. Do you think you think training is different these days? I do I do think you that. do wow I think the DIs the drill sergeants I think everybody is given, you know, PC training and mm -hmm. they're told, you know, and they're, they're given very specific instructions because I don't think mm -hmm. the military wants to be sued or, you know, the government wants to take chances on, on training. So they mm -hmm. just have to make sure that the, I, I, I think it's, it, it's got to be done a uh, way different than when we were coming up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's probably a good change overall. Yeah. What was the uh, most difficult part of your three and a half for uh, your tour in the army? I think physically some of the things were a bit taxing for me. Um, the long marches burnt me out because uh, I, I, you know, I'm Asian, I have short legs, yeah. and, you know, and you know, I, I'm not a big guy, but I, but I still hump the same amount of weight. Rich. And if they it's, put me on with an M60 yeah. or, you know, an M203, then I've got to, I've got to hump the, all that weight in the ammo. Rich, it's not uh, tall or short. It's, I don't know. I, I talked to my brother about this. Is, is it just Asians? I remember in a company of like whatever platoon or 
it was like 250 guys going up these long marches. It was just like all the Asian guys, like three or four of the Asian guys were in the back. And my brother said the same thing. I, I experienced it. It's very difficult to do. Yeah, in open air. But once you get in the jungle, though, we're quick as fuck. <laughs> you know what I mean? We don't have like, you know, the, we don't get clotheslined off, you know, branches and stuff. That was pretty nimble when, when we get, once we got into, you know, some thickness. Yeah. So what happened? What did you do when you got out? Um, well, I was, sta- I, I was stationed in California um, at Fort Ord, which is in Monterey. And uh, that base had closed just as I was getting out um, permanently. It became, I think, a, a U, like, like a UC or um, a Cal State kind of uh, campus. Um, but I like California. And, um, That's a beautiful I part of California. Yeah, I decided to stay and I kind of meandered my way up to San Jose. And I went to community college there at De Anza. Um, Because I wanted to stretch out my money as far as I could. So going to community college first. And then my my intent was to make it into Berkeley, um, which I did. Um, So after um, two years at community college, I transferred over to Berkeley. Wow. And uh, for a number of reasons, um, I ended up dropping out. What? I mean, can you share it or you'd rather not share those reasons? Uh, No, I think it was... Like many people in their twenties, um, you know, you get bad relationships. I was in a bad relationship at that time. Uh, she was a bit crazy and followed me to class, and it just became un- untenable to actually concentrate and do my studies. So I decided to uh, take a leave of absence from school and return back to the East Coast. And I just never made it back. Um, and it was very, that was probably one of the most uh, disappointing times for me because I, I had put three years in the army and then two more years. So almost five years working towards getting into my dream college. And then once I was there, it kind of evaporated. And then I went back to um, manual labor. You know, really, I, I, I could have done that right out of high school. I was <laughs> basically in the same spot that I would have been in yeah. if I didn't go to the army. What did you, um, so um, let, what did you study but, at Berkeley? Well, I wanted, I got accepted to Asian American studies, but as soon as I was there, I wanted to transfer into philosophy. So as a starting point to going into law later on. Got it. And you did what? You said two years at uh, Berkeley? No, I did two years at De Anza, and then I did maybe a semester wow. at Berkeley. It was, it, was, it, was pretty, it was pretty quick. God, and getting into Berkeley is a big deal. It's not easy to... It was a big deal. deal. I mean, I, I, for yeah. all the UCs that I applied to, I got into the ones I applied for, which was Santa Cruz, um, LA, and Berkeley. And, I, and Berkeley was always my, my dream. Yeah, yeah. And then you went to hard labor, you <laughs> manual labor, and then what, <laughs> what, what did you do after that? Well, how'd I was... How did you get out of that? that. I was stuck in a rut for a while because I didn't really see how I could get out of it without a college education. Yeah. Um, and so with the arm, with, with the GI bill, I believe there's a statute of limitations. You have to use it within a decade of right. your discharge. And I already burnt off by that point. I had burnt off like two or three years, uh, almost maybe five years actually. So I knew I had, if I was going to use it, I had to get into college ASAP. And uh, I was in Massachusetts, and I had missed all the deadlines except the art college. So I applied, and uh, they said that I had a great application letter talking about being in the military and, and the way why I wanted to go to college. But they said my portfolio was cr- was pretty terrible. Okay, so and, we're uh, they made me we're skipping some information here. I mean, okay, you you go from um, military to Berkeley Asian studies. But then how did the whole art thing come about? Um, well, that was a mis- it was It was sort of an accident because I once I had left Berkeley and I was in the U.S. Um, I mean, I was in, in Massachusetts doing wage labor. Uh, I applied for, I wanted to apply to schools and the art school was the only one that, uh, that yeah. I hadn't, I still had time to submit an application. And uh, that's, that's really how I got into it. But I mean, did you, I mean, it doesn't sound like in your journey up to that point, there was any art uh, in your sort of your experience or was there? 
there wasn't really. I mean, I heard an interest, but you know, be, also in that point between uh, being in California and returning to art school, I had I, done a lot of writing, mostly poetry, and had some poems published in an anthology um, in '98, I think it was. And uh, so it was either maybe going, maybe study writing. Um, but at that point, uh, the internet kind of bubble was just beginning to expand. Yeah. And all of these people that were doing early web design were getting these fat salaries, you know, even before they left college. Right. And so I, I already done some web design with the company that I was with before school. And I figured that was, that, that was at least a short term goal to go to art school to study design. Wow. Yeah, it's a drastic, uh, well, no, design and art is not drastic, but, you know, mm -hmm. going from like a, an Asian American studies or, you know, more mm -hmm. military and then to transition into art. I mean, is that, was that something that you thought like, okay, this is going to be a career move for the rest of your life or, I mean, cause I you think I was looking more short term. I, I think I always have been curious about a number of things and I always loved being inside of a classroom. Um, even when I was in the army, when guys would get care packages sent from home that would have, you know, candy or porn magazines or whatever yeah. they, they got from home. Uh, I, I asked some of my friends that went to college what they were reading. And I asked my mom to send those books so I wouldn't fall behind. Wow. And so when I was in, when I was in Egypt for six months um, on guard duty in the tower, I would just read books that my mom sent me. So I always felt that. You know, I could still move forward very slowly in whatever situation I was in. Yeah. And then, so in, in, in art school, what exactly did you study? Uh, I went in, I wanted to spend four full years, even though I had done two years already um, in community college. I wanted to restart and, and spend a full four years in, in college just so I could experience, you know, a, a normal university experience. Uh, I went in as a double major with graphic design and this thing called Studio for Interrelated Media, mm -hmm. which was a program that came about somewhere in the late 60s, maybe early 70s, at the advent of new technologies and art uh, in America. So a lot of people were doing performance or video or installations, uh, sound art, and that's the department that I, I, I went into. And as an artist or a student of art at the time, um, do you start to form a view of the world at that point? Or do you start thinking about sort of like what story or what point of view you're coming from? Or do you just really just go through the, the act of, I mean, walk me through it. Like, do you, at that point in your life, at that young point, do you start to think about the expression and your point of view? Or do you really work on sort of the, the art, the craft of it? Uh, the school that I went to had great studios, and you could focus on craft. You could be a really excellent craft person doing glass and metals. Um, at that time, I was mostly doing conceptual kind of artwork, things that revolved around ideas and my and my position on certain issues. Um, so I didn't. I, in fact, I graduated really being unable to draw more than a stick figure, to be honest. <laughs> Um, but I had, I, I knew about how to think about ideas and express them through artwork. But as far as being a skilled artist, that, that certainly wasn't accomplished in four years. Or an artist with a point of view. Well, I, I certainly had a point of view, um, at that point. Um, I had a point of view before I went in the military. I, I was a leftist going in. So it was very strange to be in the military being a leftist. Um, I already had my sights on Berkeley. I had this one teacher when I was in high school who had gone to Berkeley. Um, and he was sort of a radical back in the day, tear gas, student demonstrations at Berkeley. Yeah. This is the kind of thing that I wanted to go into. And so I was very influenced by a lot of leftist ideas at that time. That but also been... it was strange being in the military yeah. as well. But I always said that, you know, if you really wanted to be a, a critic, you should really know what you're criticizing. Yeah. And so at least even now, even today, I mean, I, I can't say I, I spent a long time in the military, 
but I'm sure you might agree that it's important that I can say that, you know, I've done my piece for this country. Yeah. Um, like nobody can take that away from you. So someone can come up to you in, in a bar and like be racist. Um, you can just say, I'm a veteran, right? Not, not necessarily that'll help you, but I mean, it gives you some sort of, it just breaks down a stereotype that they think you might just be freeloading off the country as an recent immigrant or something. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's ultimately street cred, right? Yeah. Um, you come from a military family with the leftist uh, ideology. How did you reconcile that with people in your family growing up? Um, or were they not? Were they very open? I think my my, my family's quite moderate. Um, they're moderate Democrats. Um, but I think um, the leftist stuff came mostly through my teachers at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I said, my family is a very working class family. So it's not, you know, we don't sit at the dinner table discussing political issues or you know, deep issues. I think a lot of that came from me doing a lot of reading and trying to be aware of different things so that I would be prepared when I had an opportunity to take advantage of those. Um, but I, some people might say that my mother must have been like a radical to adopt me in 1972 yeah. when the U.S. is still at war with Vietnam. Um, but really, I, it was very simple that my mom and my father at the time thought they couldn't conceive. And um, they just really wanted a child. It was as simple as that. So they weren't making a political statement. Mm. Why know. Vietnam? Why did they I think it was just pants. Um, friends of the family were also working some nonprofits, I think, in Vietnam, like World Vision and in other uh, charities. And they had an oppor- my, my parents' friends had an opportunity to adopt a, a girl. And they just said, we're here. Would you like us to bring you back one? Because if you were at the grocery store, it's like, you want us to pick you up a few? Wow. I mean, it was like that. That's how it happened? Yeah, basically, we're, as far as I know. We're here. Uh, we'll grab you one, too. Yeah, I think so. Okay, and so let's get into this. This is, this is good. Um, they had friends who were in Vietnam adopting a girl, mm-hmm. your parents. And yep. your parents were probably looking for a child because they couldn't have kids. Right. And so these friends... Do the paperwork for your your your, your family? No, or I think how does it... my mother hired lawyers. I think it was just uh, a suggestion. I think they certainly helped out since they they were on the ground. Yeah, they they didn't. They, it wasn't like baby lift, but they brought back several orphans. I think my batch we had maybe about seven to nine kids um, coming back, mostly to the East Coast, um, and yeah. So it wasn't just hey, we're here. I think they were already on a mission to bring some children back. Right. Got it. Got it. How old were you at the time? I was eight months when I arrived in the U.S. Oh, wow. So you were an infant. So, yeah, I was an infant. And my, my, my boy now is, is nine, nine months. So mm-hmm. it puts it in perspective. I mean, they couldn't talk. I don't know if I was walking yet. Um, yeah. So my, my entire formative experience has really been in America. Yeah. And growing up as an American. Have you ever gone back to find your biological family? Um, I tried to find them um, somewhere around maybe mid-90s once I was in Massachusetts and I had a lot of time on my hands. Um, I mean, the internet was still kind of young at that point. Um, so if you can remember back to the days when people were using like Usenet, for example. Yeah. So I went on Usenet and there was one particular list of missing people in Vietnam. And um, I scoured the list, but most of the listings were after 75. Mm-hmm. Um, and then by virtue of having that for male or female, I narrowed down to maybe just a couple entries that could possibly be made. And one of them was looking for their younger brother, um, who happened to have the same name as me, same area of birth, as far as I could tell. And um, 
so I contacted this number and this man picked up, uh, this American man. And, and I, I told him that, you know, this is how I, I'm calling this number. And he said, Oh, I know who this girl is. I sponsored her when, when she came to America, but I don't know who you are. So why don't you give me your information? And if she's interested, she'll call you back. Within an hour, I got a call back. Wow. And this woman was living in New Jersey and she said that, um, she was missing her younger brother who had the same name as me and same. And I said, she asked me if I wanted to fly over to Jersey to see her and her family. And I did. Um, even to this day, we, we, we still, um, act as family somewhat. Mm. Uh, some of the family still here in Saigon. In fact, my nephew has been working for Tom for like a decade by now. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, but I don't really, in my heart of hearts, I don't think it's my family. So you don't do, you haven't done any 23andMe genetic testing or any of that? I haven't. Um, I may. I may. I guess at this point, it's not so much a priority for me. I really, it's, my identity is kind of set long, a long time ago. I'm going to put this out there, but there's a director in Vietnam, Danny Do. Do you know who Danny Do is? It sounds familiar. He's a good friend of mine. He's from the U.S. as well, but he's been working in, in Vietnam for a long time. His picture, his picture as a young man, and he, Danny's younger than, than, than we are, but he looks exactly like my father when my father was his age. I, every time I, my brother and I, we trip out. We look at Danny, and we look at his face, and we just trip out. It's like this is our father's son. Um, and you know, typically I, I feel like every time I see nieces and nephews, they look more like their uncles and, you know, it's always like that. The kids, you yeah. know, it's like, sometimes the kids don't look anything like the father or the mother, but they look like the, yeah. so what I did was I ordered a kit for Danny because my brother, my mother, my, myself and my wife, we all have 23 Me accounts set up and it's very easy because you can send a kit to whatever addresses like Amazon or we, you know, I'll just order it. And then next time Danny was in town, I said, yo, you got to take this because, you know, but turns out he's not related to us, but he, okay. his family's from the same town as my dad. So it's wow. like, Vin, Vin Lam, Vin Lam. so it's, it's always been in the back of my, so I can't like, I can't live knowing that my, you know, my dad and Danny might be related. So I had to order that test. But anyway, uh, that's just. Yeah. I might do it. I mean, I did get a DNA test recently um, just to prove my paternity, my son. Yeah. Uh, you need that for, you know, documents and things like that. For um, Especially once I bring to the embassy or the consulate to apply for his American citizenship. But, um, but I haven't done sort of a uh, genealogy sort of DNA test. I, I may do it, but I'm not in America, so it's it's not as easy here. I can bring back a, a kit one day for you. Um, and your sister oh, okay. is in Jersey still. Yep. Yeah, yep. I can get a a kit out to her, and then I'll bring a kit back for you, and then you can do the thing. I'll bring it back to America, and then you know I'll pop it in the mail, and you can create your online account, and you can see all of it. You know, settle it once and for all. <laughs> but. I don't know if you're interested in doing that. I know it could be a. a very I, I'd be interested. I, I'm just curious. I mean, recently I have read a lot of news where a lot of these databases now are being sold to private companies yeah. uh, to catch criminals and other things, which, which 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 is great, but it's also some issues dealing with yeah some privacy. privacy issues. Huge, yeah. That's another big concern. I think that um, you know we as people in the art world or artists who worry about those sort of things and issues uh tom and i we discuss this all the time i mean he's more of a of a technologist he loves the idea of technology and he doesn't really care about who's into it. but i i kind of i kind of have reservation a lot of reservations about how much information we're giving up how do you feel about that i suppose i haven't been very diligent i, I much like tom that I'm, I, I've been willing to forfeit a lot of information in exchange for free product. Yeah. Um, though, um, I'm more concerned, you know, how it, how it might develop as we're, as we continue forward, particularly as, you know, I don't want to be a liability to my children, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but I'm a little more cautious. I mean, we post stuff all the time, but to be honest, I, I, I don't know if, if my son's going to resent that later. You know, just because they're my children, I, I, I do believe they have some basic human rights. And yeah. I'm just trying to be aware of that. Yeah, it's heavy. It's a heavy, uh, it's a strange time that we live in. Yeah. So after um, you graduate from art school, what is your, where do you go from there? Uh, I graduated, I think, in May, and by September I was in Vietnam. Okay, so uh, how, what led you to Vietnam? I had gone, I had returned to Vietnam in 2000, I believe it was, with a school trip. So it was my first time back to the country after being born. Um, what was that like? And, you know, I thought it was going to be much more profound than it was. I thought I was going to, like, land on the ground and I kiss the earth or, or, you know, a lot of like melodramatic stuff. I just like, if I had found my mother, it wouldn't be like, like when I went to New Jersey, my parents were in Phil were in Philadelphia at that time. So we traveled from Jersey to, to meet my parents. I don't know, like an everyday thing. It was just like, Oh, hi. And, and and I always imagine, you know, like slow motion, mother and child running towards each other and embracing and tears. It wasn't anything like that. So, um, yeah, the whole Vietnam thing has come pretty naturally. Mm. Um, so you didn't come off the tarmac like, you know, in the, in the 2000s, late 90s, we'd come down the tarmac and we'd walk and, you know, it's just like hot air, you know. coming. Oh, it was hot. Night. It yeah. was hot, and it had that. It had a certain smell. Smell, yeah. Uh, but Saigon, in particular, I just took a liking to the city. There's other cities that I felt the same way when you when you go there, even with a limited amount of time. You say, I could possibly live here. Um, I felt that way about Berlin. Uh, I felt that way about Madrid. But um, Saigon has just happened to be another one of those cities. I said. I could give it a chance. Yeah. And uh, I'd come over for about six months, planning to go back. And because like, six months is the window before you have to repay your student loans. And um, yeah, six months now is, is, is 18 years. And <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to ever go back. Back, yeah. I don't know. What did you do when you landed? How did you go about like living? I mean, what you, you well, checked I already the hotel? had some friends here. Um, from, well, th there was a couple of students that had, were exchange students at the college that I had befriended. And so when I came to Vietnam, I, I had already discussed with them, um, you know, it, could you help me out? You know, help me learn about the, the city, help me find a place to live. So I, I had a lot of, um, support in the beginning. Um, and it was exciting. I mean, yeah. it was the first time that I had been outside of the country on my own terms that meaning not by the military right um so at that point you know i didn't really have a career so to speak of i just graduated from college and um so it was kind of blue sky uh and i i i, I really enjoyed being outside of the country because everything was so new yeah to me yeah and so you go on for a week or two or a month and you know you start to think about well what am i going to do next i mean how does the next stage of your well, life it comes come here to, uh, specifically to start a performance art collective which we did and um i had started teaching us at at the fine art university um for a semester and a half i think it was and then i um started working for my friend's fashion company and um it wasn't until I, I came here in 2003 and in 2006, um, Tom and I, your brother, uh, both joined RMIT at the same time. And um, from there, I was just, you know, working anywhere else in the world. I had a nine to five job. Right, right. And Viet, what, describe Vietnam at the time when you had just got there. Um, well, you didn't have to wear helmets, a um, lot of motorbikes. Um, most people were accessing the internet in internet cafes that were open 24 hours, a lot of smoke. It's kind of like a bar with computers. Um, 
most people were using Yahoo as a messenger client. Um, I think Facebook was around, but I don't think anybody really turned yeah. onto it. I didn't start my account until like maybe 2005 or something like that. Maybe, maybe even later. Um, yeah, it was, the city wasn't as developed, but I have a lot of good memories about that time. Sure. About you, were re, you felt, ironically, I felt very free. And this is, the irony is that people would say, oh, you're going to a communist nation. Your mail's opened and, and of other things that are kind of sacrosanct in America or illegal if somebody opens your mail in, in America. I just got used to it and I felt like I did have um, a lot of freedom here to do what I wanted. What, in respect to the people, um, did you feel a sense of, of closeness with the, the, the people, the Vietnamese, or was there a, distant, a distance because you couldn't really speak the, the language? I think there's been a distance. I mean, I was always, yeah, I think without speaking the language when I arrived, I, there's a lot of distance and a lot of privilege, in fact, too, since I was with you at that time. Um, my, 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 my social circle was a little bit smaller. Um, but then by being in the arts, it, it expanded through that community. So I, I could speak English and still develop works in Vietnam with Vietnamese artists. Um, but I've, I think when I was really young, I was an extrovert. But at some point, nearing in my 30s, mm. I started becoming more introverted. So I, even now, I'm, I'm very much an introverted type. Um, so my social circle is really small. Um, and it's mostly art-specific or creative, the creative sort of network. Do you, do you feel like you've closed the gap culturally, though? No, I don't think so. Um, I'm always going to be not fully Vietnamese. Even if I finish this uh, degree and I have to have certification of you know, intermediate level Vietnamese, academic Vietnamese, I don't think um, my thinking is very much an, an American viewpoint. Um, but my family's here and my wife, my children. Um, and at some point, I'm going to have lived in Vietnam longer, longer. than I have lived in the U.S. Yeah. yeah. So now with your work, um, as it relates to the, the culture um, of where you've lived for 18 years, are you doing work that is related to where you're living or is it more of an, on a global uh, level? I think it's more global. Um, of course, some of the materials I use are very local or I, I sometimes deal with issues through the lens of Vietnam, me mm -hmm. living here. But, mo but my work is not autobiographical. So I, I, there's rarely any works that talk about my own lived experience as an adoptee or an orphan or a VQ living here. I tend not to base works on my own personal life directly. Um, I just speak to issues that concern me and I express them through various types of artwork, from sculpture can, to drawing. Can you describe and, some of it? Can you describe um, the, the evolution, the start of it, and sort of like the process of where you, how you've evolved to today? Um, yeah. So my degree is in media art, which deals with art and technology or performance. And I was very much planning to become a media artist while I was in school. Uh, but over time, I, like I told you before, that I graduated without a lot of manual skill. I had a lot of conceptual or intellectual skill in developing ideas. But I didn't have my, the skill with my own hands to create those works. So very often in the early part of my career, I would come up with ideas and have them fabricated you know, go somewhere to have it. Right. I always felt like I was shortchanging myself. And um, I decided to return to learn how to draw myself. Uh, as a precursor to teaching drawing at the university. But I, I felt like I always wanted to be able to paint or draw or sculpt. And um, 
I made a decision, I think it was around 2013, to really put my full effort into doing that. So, so it's like a, over the past years, like a, I, I, I... Sorry. I, no, no, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Over the years? Um, uh, so I, if we, we consider like media-based work as more immaterial. Mm -hmm. It's not so important about the object. So an immaterial practice to a more material one where I'm using clay or paint. Um, so I, I really made that transition over to almost being exclusively immaterial. But now that I've been hired again to teach at a Vietnamese university, we are starting a digital art major. And so I'll be contributing to the, the development of that program. And so I find myself being pulled back into art and technologies again. Yeah, so you've, since 2013, have focused more on tactile, more analog Absolutely. art, creation of... Right. And you, you in, in terms of digital, on the digital side, I mean, how, how are you going to kind of like lead in that way when your focus is more on the, the analog and tactile? Well, I think there can be a bridge. I think um, a number of digital technologies could actually improve your work, even if the final form is something, you know, very traditional. For example, if I wanted to um, car carve out a sculpture in stone, for example, I could model it in 3D first, figure out where the problem areas are, or I could... Yeah. Um, model something in 3D first, and then find out how much material I need without wasting any material. So there's many processes that I feel the digital sort of realm might be able to complement what I do, uh, even if I'm working with a chisel and hammer. Wow. What's the art scene like in Vietnam? I mean, I, I don't uh, live there and I don't know it. Um, how would you describe it? To people who are living, I on think the it's outside. quite healthy. Um, most people can say that contemporary art really started in earnest around 1995, where when the U.S. lifted its trade embargo. Um, so early artists, mostly from Hanoi, were the first generation of artists to exhibit internationally, dealing with idea-based works. Uh, and I arrived in 2003, which is almost you know about eight years after that. Um, we never had any of the institutional support that many other regional countries such as Singapore have, but there's been a lot of artist initiated projects and spaces which have developed a nascent art scene here. Do, do you um, think there will, healthy now. do you think there ever will be a change in sort of the attitude from the government to support up and coming artists or the art scene? I think so. Um, you know, there's different approaches. They may see it as um, a commercial activity to increase their favorability for service-based economies or creative-based economies. That's usually when governments start kicking in when they think there's something to reap from that. And, and who um, would usually lead the charge for those kind of initiatives? Uh, private spaces, uh, coupled with some of the um, government uh, governmental organizations, maybe from France or from the U.S. or from Germany, they've always been advocates uh, through their own cultural organs, such as Alliance Francaise, um, British Council, um, but the Institute. In that, they sometimes act as a bridge to connect artists and government. But I think. The change won't happen anytime soon. Um, I mean, Vietnam has a lot of urgent problems still that, it, that are probably more urgent than that that it needs to deal with. Like what? Land issues, for example. Um, when it comes to infrastructure projects, you have to clear land. Um, they have issues with um, education. I mean, uh, if they really want to be competitive in this region and then more broadly globally uh, they say that I, I just read in the paper that english proficiency in vietnam is going down again hmm. is, I, I don't know i don't it, it seems incredible that they don't put more attention to that 
Um, I'm not making a statement that I believe English is a yeah. better or worse language, but the reality is that to be fully integrated into a global kind of conversation, they're going to need much more English fluency um, among among young people. Um, are you? You said earlier uh, that you're working on your Vietnamese. Um, speaking of English yeah. and Vietnamese, like what, what's that experience been like for you? Um, it's hard. Uh, even though I've lived here so long, I was stuck at an English speaking university for nine years. So I wasn't able to really develop, you know, my speaking or writing ability. What motivated uh, now you? Now that I'm in class five days a week, um, it's hard, but it, I, I love it. I think um, I've always been interested in languages. Unfortunately for me, when I was in high school, I chose Latin. So I had a, I have a very intuitive sense of European romance languages. Yeah. And, um, and I'm great with scientific kind of names and nomenclature. But yeah, it, it didn't really like give me any other real world. But it helped. Uh, Latin helped. Tom and I both had two years of it. Oh, yeah. Sweet. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it definitely helps with uh, expanding that, uh, the Western vocabulary. Right. But uh, yeah, Vietnamese is a tricky, it's a tricky thing. Things are kind of like, um, it's all over the place. But English is a lot more complicated, I think. Cause I think so. Two words can sound alike, but can mean totally different yeah. things. Spellings That's, are different. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of um, exceptions to its own rules. Mm -hmm. And your pronunciation in Vietnamese is consistent. It's always the same. Like if you see it spelled out a certain way, it's always going to be that way. I always get confused with the X's and the S's. Oh, yeah, it's hard. It's the hard. Or sh yeah, yeah, I still can't figure it out sometimes. Um, but I read and write, but I find it to be, um, it's, I mean, obviously, it's very empowering when you can sort of mm. swim in and, 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 and be in that world with other people who can, you know, speak that fluently. It's just very empowering to know you're part of that and uh, i commend you i mean for, for 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 taking it up and, and attacking it and being a part of it you speak you know? vietnamese largely at the home growing up yes uh i we spoke it at home and then my parents were were very very catholic so we mm -hmm. were raised with uh bible study at night we'd read parables we'd read out of the bible in vietnamese and they would just really break down the language and then we would watch so much, you know, the it's called Phim Chung, which is um, episodics, uh, yeah. martial arts episodics. They're like 30 videotapes, and we just like right. rent batches of it, and then we'll watch it, and they would break down what what what's being said. But the language inside of these martial arts episodics are different than the Bible. So we were given sort of like this three three way breakdown of okay you have your vernacular every day at home you know with family then you have the fim chung language and then you have the bible language and they're all sort of all over the place mm. so they would say you know you don't use this in everyday language because you're going to sound like you came out of a chinese film you know ah. so it's like all of these um hours spent with a lot of Vietnamese uh, inside the, in, in, inside our house. And that kind of, I think, led Tom and I to really gravitate towards being around the Vietnamese community um, mm -hmm. in, in, you know, working inside with, with, with the art world or the film world and really enjoying that um, time with the Vietnamese. In your family, uh, it's you and Tom are the, the children? Yeah, just the two of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just the two of us. And I thank my parents um, so much for really putting that love of the Vietnamese music, Vietnamese, you know, mm -hmm. um, reading and, and, and instilling this deep sense of connection to the motherland. You know, I think without mm -hmm. it, I don't know where I'd be. You know, it's mm -hmm. still use it uh, every day now. You know, I write bios for the guests and I put together um, blurbs and I work with my mom and she helps me. And I have interns that now are now sort of working with their moms and they were born here and we do every, you know, we put together an English translation and a Vietnamese translation, depending on who we're, who the guests are. So, uh, yeah, it's deep. 
Do you talk to your um, children in English or do you talk to them in Vietnamese? Mostly in English, though, now that I've, I've been taking Vietnamese and, and for certain phrases that, that, can, that I know and can repeat um, often. So it, it's mixed. Uh, increasingly, I'm using more Vietnamese. Are um, you discovering new nuances? In the in, in the community and the society that you're you're a part of now, as a result of learning um, the language, or not really. I think it's a little early to tell because I'm still. I never think in Vietnamese. I, I mean, have reactions in Vietnamese, but mm-hmm. I think I still. I'm waiting for that time when I dream in Vietnamese. Mm-hmm. You know that, that 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 would be sort of like maybe. An epiphany to be able to hmm. naturally think through that language. Right now, everything's tra- always translated. Yeah, um, yeah. in my mind. Um, but 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 as with any country, learning a little bit helps you socially a lot. Just just by showing the effort. Yeah. So you know, if I got pulled over for a traffic stop before, I would just like I don't speak any Vietnamese, and hoping that would give me a pass. But now I think it's it's better if I just say like hi and just try to speak as much as I can to the officer yeah. to establish a rapport, and then hopefully then you know Good just, hopefully happen. it'll work out better. Yeah. But but now I, I instinct instinctively would make the effort rather than just try to use that privilege of trying to escape by not understanding. Can you give a little history on uh, Operation Baby Lift and your sort of, I mean, not your voluntary involvement, but mm. your, you know, how you were part of that story? Well, I wasn't, I'm not a part of Baby Lift. Uh, Baby Lift happened in 1975. And I, I had left on a plane uh, in 1972. Though I know some returnees that have come back to Vietnam that were a part of Baby Lift. Um, as far as I know, it's, it's pretty tragic. Uh, one of the planes had crashed full of yeah. babies. Um, yeah, I don't really know a lot about its history specifically, only that, you know, it was, it was a pretty big event, particularly among Vietnamese adoptees. I, I'm sure there's a network of former baby lift Vietnamese adoptees. Um, but I don't know so much about it, to be honest. If you were still living in the U.S., what would you? What do you think you'd be doing right now? Oh, it's so hard to say. I mean, if I had not come to Vietnam, I would have, out of school, likely moved out of Boston uh, within a year of my graduation. Mm-hmm. Neither moved back to California or moved to New York. Um, be, as a professional artist, Boston is probably not the the best spot to be in. It's, it's great for education, um, but not really as a practicing artist. Um, what would I have been? I don't know. I, I, I certainly would have had to support myself from the beginning. So I could have been like making artwork while being a barista at Starbucks during the day. I, I, who knows? But I, I would have probably had to do a lot, two things at once. And in Vietnam, I could fo- focus fully on the artwork. I'm just going to With, um, in regards to censorship in Vietnam mm-hmm. as an artist, do you feel like it's changing and evolving? Or do you feel like it's sort of really not applied to what you do? Oh, I, no, I, I, it definitely applies to what I do. Um, how so? so in, how is it applied? In context, like all exhibitions... Um, and you, you may be more familiar with how it relates to film production, but all exhibitions need to have um, a guide prep, you know, kind yeah. of a, a permission paper, paper mm-hmm. um, before it's exhibited to the public. So everything's kind of needs needs a form or permit. Um, when I first arrived to Vietnam, uh, I w- had an officer assigned to me, sort of like. Um, I don't know, they work for the government in secret police or something like that. And um, and 
I, I got to know this person. I would sometimes meet the officer. Wait, how did you get, on. what do you mean you got assigned? I mean, you just to go and file a... Well, at like, that time period, you know, Vietnam was still not a lot of foreigners here in 2003. Um, and so... But you were assigned an officer because you're an artist or just because you moved into maybe an Maybe artist class also did you. I'm, I'm not mm-hmm. sure. But... um. Yeah, I had met the officer a couple of times, and um, there's a woman officer from Hanoi, and um, she seemed pretty friendly, um, slightly interested in what we were doing, but then something happened in 2006, um, well, two, first it happened in 2004, there was a group exhibition, and all the artists, it um, was 13 artists, and I was the only DQ artist, but I got denied permission. So that was the first exhibition I was thrown off of. And then from 2006 to 2012, I didn't show anything in Vietnam. How come? So for six years, and I couldn't get a permit. Oh, they, did, they wouldn't let you? Yeah. And did they give a so, reason? Well, that's the, f- the funny thing. They, don't, they never do. Um, and they don't need to, really. I mean, there's nothing. They, they don't have to give you like, a critique or feedback. You know, th- there's cases where they'll say, we have a specific problem with this one artwork in an exhibition could you please either cover it up or have limited viewings or um but normally they don't they don't bother um because they don't need to be accountable to anybody but themselves uh and it was very hard in the early days to have like performance based events or new kinds of exhibition formats um but i think overall it's, I think everything in Vietnam overall is improving slowly, mm-hmm. except COVID. They've improved rapidly to a, a, do a fantastic job here. That's what I've been hearing. I think Vietnam is among one of the best countries in the world, especially given that it's proximity to China. Um, yeah, they, they take it very seriously here. Yeah. And uh, it, it gave me a new faith, actually. Mm-hmm. These were all uh, oh, communism is very bureaucratic and counterintuitive. But now that I see how it's dealing with COVID, I have a lot of respect and a lot of rethinking towards, you know, structures that I thought were impeding me to actually protecting me and in, in, in doing good. I mean, you, you look at what we're going through in the U.S. It's an absolute it's, joke. Yes. Yeah. It's, you know, and, you know, back in, I think it was back in March, April, you know, when you were looking at the the reports and the news coming out of Vietnam and it was, it felt like it was like chest thumping. Hey, we're doing a great job. We're doing a great job. We have nothing. We have zero cases. We have one case. Okay. We're getting, you know, we're, we're, it's all under control. You think it's a bunch of bullshit, right? Like in my head, I'm like, mm-hmm. this is a bunch of bullshit. Right. Like propaganda, yeah, yeah, propaganda, right? You're like, this is no way because we're, the, you know, living in a in an advanced country here in the U.S. Right. We have everything under control. We have the CDC. We have all of these magnificent NIH. We we have it. Yeah. And then you start to think and and follow this stuff, right? You hear the propaganda from Vietnam, and then come a few, maybe six months later. What really blows my mind away was this, when Vietnam opened back up and people mm-hmm. were heading back out and living regular lives a few months after mm-hmm. their lockdown in Vietnam. And here, meanwhile, we're, it's like at an all time high, it's exploding exponentially now. Now, like right now in December, it's mm-hmm. out of control. Yeah. And we're sitting here looking at countries like Taiwan and Vietnam. My wife is from Taiwan family and they're out having a regular life Mm. and it makes you think it makes you rethink um you know every blessing is a curse and every curse is a blessing you know it's really that kind of world that we live it's like flipped upside down now i mean here in america nobody um we're all so burnt out right we're so tired of this um you know Nobody can get their act together. The government, the people, we're just, we're all confused. And meanwhile, I, I talk to my brother and every life on the ground in Vietnam is, is great. 
Wonderful. Until this week. Yeah, until, until this, this week. week. Yeah. So, yeah, just a couple of days, well, a couple of days ago, they caught a community infection, um, which we hadn't had for like 80 days or something like that. Um, so, but the nice thing is, as soon as it was announced, everything shut down. Yeah. Um, not everything, but, but universities shut down, schools. So, everybody takes it very seriously. Mm-hmm. Right? I guess that's the point that everybody wears a mask. Yeah. Just as a natural habit. Maybe it's, yeah, maybe it's an Asian thing where community or family or whatever, but nobody. Nobody feels that's an infringement on their basic right, um, human right. Um, but then again, I don't, I don't know how much agency Vietnamese feel they have anyways, you know, towards some aspects of their life. But I feel better living here. Um, I worry about my mom. She's, you know, old and she's all yeah. in all the high category risk brackets. Um, I think the world is pretty just dumbfounded how fumbled America dealt with that. Yeah. And you're just, I don't know, is it sort of, of course, America has been on the top since World War II, you know, minus Pearl Harbor, came away out in states, didn't have any of the cities bombed, and kind of emerged as, you know, as the Cold War came out as being the superpower. 89 rolled around. Modern regimes fell, Soviet Union a couple of years later after that. And then it was just America and its sort of paradigm of the world. Meanwhile, the rise of China. And so Vietnam's in this precarious position of having to kind of alternate between China and Vietnam, I mean, China and America for its own survival. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. Both are threats, to be honest. On one hand, you know, these boys have this intrinsic antagonism towards China. I mean, that's as do maybe some would say Koreans and Japanese from, you know, World War II. Right. But Vietnam has it from a thousand years ago. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, I, I wouldn't, I'd be afraid for Vietnam if it all with China's path. Of you know, no Gmail, locking down every you know all uh, networks such as Facebook and etc. Outside of China, if if it was like this, Vietnam would stimulate its growth very quickly. Mm-hmm. I'm glad it has a foresight to be as open as it can. It's not, it's not totally open society. You have tons of things blocked here, like Radio Free Asia, or you, depending on what ISP you're on, BBC will be blocked. But overall, um, but can you still get those better. things through VPNs and stuff? You could, but I mean, I can just turn on the television set and get it now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I haven't used a VPN in a long time. The last time I think is when I was in China. Um, I, I don't feel like I don't have limited access to really anything from being here. So I, uh, I really want to ask a sensitive question. Um, sure. Living in Vietnam, do you feel that there is a threat from China? I think so, for sure. Um, I think one of it has to do with the provocations that obviously they've been doing in the South China Sea. Um, I don't know. I worry that. On one hand, you could still win a court case in The Hague or an arbitration for the UN, such yeah. as it's the same thing that Philippines did. But at the end of the day, those islands are fortified now, militarily fortified. You can still claim them, but for all intents and purposes, they're, gone. they're not yours anymore. I hate to say, even me saying that, it's sort of like uh, yeah. sacrilege, you know, a blasphemy here. Um, the only thing you can do is start sinking some ships. Um, but how well would that go? I, I don't know. I mean, Vietnam really did a number of China in 79. It repelled them very easily. 
but it's a different world now. Yeah. It's a world where it doesn't mean that you have to go over and carpet bomb somebody. You could just hack their energy grid, you know, through computer programs. It's a very different world. Um, very quickly, things can devolve into chaos if you have no electricity or mm-hmm. other things like that. Or embargoes, kind of simple embargoes. Yeah. How do you think the... But then, just... again, I mean, you could say, well, the China hasn't really been in a serious war since the founding of the Republic, you know? So the U.S. has been in constant war with everybody all the time. So China would that does have some, I don't know, if they were to make that argument that we're not the aggressor. But I don't buy it. I think um, as every, every nation is interested in itself, it's in self-interest. But I think the world agrees that that nine dash line is pretty egregious. I mean, it's a tongue that goes way outside of the border of China. It was more conforming to the, yeah. to the topography of, the, of China. Maybe it wouldn't be so controversial. How do you think the rest of society, Vietnamese nationals on the ground, feel about China? What's your opinion on that? I mean, Vietnamese have always felt sort of a threat from China, yet having China um, sort of control Vietnam for a millennia, a lot of its traditions are deeply rooted here. So it's I think most people would choose and pick but what what things that you know have been fully integrated in their lifestyle, which is Chinese cultural effects, but not necessarily accept Chinese sort of national domination in its modern state. There's a clear line there. Yeah. But I feel um, like it's in, inevitable. I feel like throughout the region, it's inevitable going to, I don't know if it's in our lifetime, but potentially go to the Chinese. I know that that's such a sensitive topic to talk about these days. I don't think China China would try to annex Vietnam. I think that's just a bad move. If history tells you anything, don't try to conquer Vietnam and don't try to conquer Afghanistan because they're both like, (laughs) both dragging them out. Yeah. but economically, in other things, sure, they, they, they'll, they'll have a lot of leverage, militarily, economically. There's so much to this topic that um, we possibly could not cover, um, but it's definitely in the psyche of, of people who, who express things that, like us. You know, we, mm. we, we think about things and they get incorporated into our art, they get incorporated into what we say and how we, we present to the world are our, 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 our thinking and um, it's it's on a lot of people's minds and um, does it ever seep out into your sort of the art world um, this topic of China and it's very sensitive here if you, you you really can't make a lot of artwork dealing with the issue of the South China Sea for example this is so sensitive and raw here um, and I think Yeah, I think we can bring in these issues into our work, but you just got to be very clever about it. Um, but you can't be, be very direct about it, saying this, this work directly deals with this conflict of interest. How do you find inspiration for your work? Where I just trust my from? instinct. I do a lot of reading. Um, I'm on the internet to capture my daily news. Most of my work is just a reaction to what I think about various issues. So maybe I might do one dealing with, I don't know, the networks of the One Road, One Belt project and how that mapping might convert to you in artwork, for example. Um, but I, for example, I think China has other problems that are much more urgent than actually taking the South China Sea at the mm-hmm. moment. Such as? Taiwan, for example. Um, I don't know. I think 
I think maybe this is my own speculation without without any factual basis. Um, I'm pretty sure that she would want to take Taiwan during his reign. Um, that would be very scary. Um, yeah. Because then that potentially could start like a more Domino. global conflict. Yeah. You know? China's lucky that it hasn't had a jihad declared against it for what's doing in Xinjiang. You know, for the Uyghurs. But yeah. um, I don't know. If it gets too harsh, you never know. I mean, Pakistan, Afghanistan, they border China. Um, you could have on the Western Front a big problem if they, if they don't really deal with this right. Um, so there's other things that China has to probably right. worry about than Vietnam, for example. Well, that gives a little... Uh gives us a little break <laughs> yeah. thinking about the pressure. How, how has the birth of your son changed you um, both from, you know, from your art or has it? I don't know yet though. Um, you know, as an adoptee, I never knew my biological yeah. parents. I, mean, I haven't taken the 23 and me. Is it 23 and me? 23 and me. Yeah. 23 and me. I haven't had any DNA tests. So, I've lived my whole life existentially being alone, meaning that, not that I felt lonely, but that I, most people take for granted that they have parents and they know who they are. Yeah. I grew up not knowing that and, and therefore not knowing my own medical history or, or really anything. Um, and I thought I was going to kind of come into the world sort of as a loner or orphan and just kind of leave that way as well. They create artwork in the process. I had never been particularly family oriented or necessarily wanted children. Yeah, why did you get married? I mean, what, what inspired that? Um, just fall in love. And, and I felt that it was the right thing for me to do. And, um, and shortly after, we have a, a kid, and it really, it really does change. I mean, I, yeah. I used to always hate listening to parents talk about the kids, though. You know, it's like, it's like yeah. showing Cringy. like family yeah. vacation photos. You know, it's like everybody has experience. We know what you mean, but I think it's a joy. I did. I, I'm I'm doing this late in life. I'm 48, almost 49. Yeah. Um, but it actually helps me think about. A lot of things that I observe in, in my own son brings back memories that have probably been very dormant in my own mind mm. for a long time, like childhood memories or things like this, that could only be accessed through like tripping before. But now I can, now they can come pretty naturally. You know, it's, you know. Yeah. Speaking of which, if you want to light up, feel free to light up. Oh, did you see me with a cigarette? Yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I uh, obviously smoked for oh, many, many years. And Physically? yeah, yeah, oh, okay. yeah. If you want to smoke, yeah, yeah. light it up. Yeah. What do they used to say in the military? If you have got him, light him, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. light up. Um, yeah, Ch children are tri trip. I, I share that same uh issue. I hate talking about my kids, I hate showing pictures, but yeah. damn, they're so cute sometimes, right? Yeah. It, it's uh, I think, um. I feel more human. I feel like, you know, I feel like more complete, actually, you know, that I have a more rounded experience. Um, I was quite selfish before. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? Speaking to that, though, I, I feel what you just said about selfish. I feel like I do. I never want to say I'm doing this for my children because I think that's yeah. like it. It's they don't they're not asking for it. I'm I'm just like if I feel like I'm imposing that if I say oh I'm doing that. Nobody ever asks you to do anything for your children. You know I hate it when parents say I'm doing this all for you. Don't I don't want <laughs> I don't want to hear it. I don't want you to do anything for me. Although my mom is a the most you know giving and loving human being that I've ever known. But I feel like kids um, need to just have their own way of 
of living and and not be right. tethered to kind of like what we oh I did that for you or that guilt that that uh, yeah. Is that a Vietnamese thing or is that a... I was just going to say that thing. I was just going to say, I didn't want to say it's a a Vietnamese culture thing, but I think it it, it very much is. But, you know, that being said, I think the Vietnamese culture does really um, take care of their children. Um, And I think to a fault, right? I think uh, it's cultural, cultural indoctrination that you have to really take care of your kids. I mean, give them all you got. But I don't like to think that I do any of my work for them. You know, I don't make money for them. I don't make, you know, art for them. I don't uh, work hard for them. I I really work hard so I can refine my own spirit and refine my own soul. So in the end, you know, when I look back, I I just maybe and leading by example is more important than I think so, for sure. Doing something. Being happy with what you do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I agree. My father spent decades doing work and not being happy. You know, he was always mm. always an artist and he probably wanted to live a more free, more artistic life. And I don't think he was able to. And thank, thankfully, he never said, I'm doing this for you. You know, he never said that to my brother and I. And I, I thank did him. He ever, did he mention that he was happy that you both were really oh, exploring? Yeah. Yeah, he's very proud of he was very proud of that when he was alive, yeah. And 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 it wasn't a perfect relationship, but he definitely inspired my brother and I to really um explore um expression. Uh he was not afraid of it. He was um he was a very open thinker and he used to always say that uh the there's only one language uh, for human beings is the language of intellects. Mm. Uh, so whatever language you speak, you can always connect with other people. If you can, you know, bridge the gap intellectually and, and, and he practiced it too. I mean, I would see him in very, um, for me, it was uncomfortable, you know, growing up, uh, I, he'd be around, you know, we were a family of drapery makers. We made uh, window coverings uh, my, my whole adult life uh, young, growing up. And he was dealing with a lot of interior designers who were like in a very uh, 1% of, of LA and Hollywood. And he would meet with these um, interior designers and his, his English was broken. But I always observed how comfortable he was. And he was comfortable because he came from that sort of intellectual like, the only language is intellectual. And so he would draw diagrams of what he thought would look good on the window. And so he was able to really have that confidence to say expression and story is sort of like the, the, the benchmark of, of, of anything. And if they have any sort of like sense, these people usually white uh, women who are in the interior design business that were married to really higher um, socially, um, men who who were uh, you know agents or producers or lawyers and doctors in in LA and they come from a class where they could have easily looked down to my father um but they didn't because he came with a bag of tricks that were just kind of like you couldn't really see it but it was just in the way he expressed his uh his his creation and i mm-hmm. we always respected him for that uh immensely yeah and that was like i think our first uh our first example of, of leading by example, not really talking about, you know, oh, I'm doing this for you. No, you never, ever uh, said that. That sort of reminds me of like Goodwill hunting some way where you have the guy sweeping the halls yeah. of MIT, but looking at that board and saying, like, I know what that means. Yeah. Not that anybody cares because you're a janitor, you know, but wherever you are, being engaged and curious with the world. Um, hopefully, I mean, that, that's got to be the best thing a parent can instill to their children is curiosity. It keeps you going, it keeps you young. Yeah, and, and Tom and I, we talk about that a lot. We talk about that in the early days of, you know, going back and forth to Vietnam. We were always concerned about, and especially when he started teaching at RMIT, we were talking about the curiosity 
of the students or uh, the creative, how open to creativity uh, the students were and, you know, what were the factors that made America or the American creative much more dynamic than uh, it's a debate that I think is ongoing and it's, there's no finality, but I, it's definitely improving um, by, 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 by leaps and, you know. Give me a second, I'm just gonna put this button on. Sure, sure. Okay, I'm back. Yeah, and you know, there's uh, students that obviously work for, for, for Tom now, you know, at, at his uh, animation company and the toy companies, and we can see the level of creativity is, is amazing. It's, it's breathtaking. I mean, there's a lot of potential here. I, I don't know what the current demographic is, but at one point there was like 60 or 65% of the population was under like 25. Mm -hmm. here. Um, I don't know if that applies any longer, but there's a huge potential for young people. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of hope. And um, I would love to live in Vietnam um, at full, full time at one, at one point in my life. I mean, my children mm -hmm. are, you know, Vietnamese and Taiwanese. So we'd like to, you know, split our time between Taiwan, Vietnam and, and the U S and, and have them experience, you know, all three cultures. And that would right. be, that would be amazing. And then there was this idea of like, you know, as we're putting together this podcast, you know, um, the people that I work with, we talk about the blurb, like the description. Mm -hmm. And at some point we were talking about, um, this idea of a third culture, you know, we're constantly talking about this idea of a third culture. So we're, we're Vietnamese uh, by birth and uh, our motherland is Vietnamese, but we're Americans uh, because we're raised here. And the third culture is the Vietnamese American experience. Or, you know, if you're in Europe and you're Vietnamese uh, origin and it's a Vietnamese European thing, but there's this third co culture um, that is uh, coming out of, uh, of the new work mm -hmm. of the new, um, arrangement that we have is the diaspora. Right. We decided to call this po podcast, uh, and, and I'm telling you right now, but um, uh, recently, uh, Bamian, which is three regions, right. north, yep. central, south. And yep. my mom and I, we've been talking about this daily, and uh, we just recently thought of another thing. It was like, okay, well, if it's three regions, it also can refer to the third culture as well. Right. Right. So, because in the beginning, I, I wanted to call it booming, which is for, right. but, but she said, and I asked a lot of people from Vietnam and they said, that's not going to make sense to the, the Vietnamese. Okay. Right, right, right. So, so now we're just going to call it Bamin and then that Bamin can go for either the North, Central and South, or it can mean Vietnamese American and then Vietnamese American. So. Right, right. What do you think about the large sort of, Republican slash Trump support among the Vietnamese community in America? Well, I always, I have a lot of family that are in that camp, right? I always attribute it to two things. Um, there is a huge body constituency of, of, of Vietnamese Catholics. Mm -hmm. um, and v Vietnamese Catholics are very concerned about anti-abortion. Right. So uh, Trump, you know, put in, um, the new uh, Supreme Court um, justice, and she's anti-abortion. So I, I know that they lean that way, right? And then you have the anti-China component. Mm -hmm. so those two things dominate their headlines. Mm -hmm. And I think whoever is responsible for the Vietnamese Trump um, constituency or, or votes, they know how to really um, mm -hmm. plant their foot and their flag down on that. Those uh, those areas so i can't i can't argue with family or people that i know about those two two issues because i'm not going to change their mind you know they're not right. going to listen to what i have to say and you know and i you know so i but i'm very moderate you know i'm very open to to all ideas and i'm i'm willing to kind of talk about things but <laughs> it's a it's a I think we're in a we're in a horrible place, you know, with the Trump presidency. Whether you're yeah. you know conservative or you know you're liberal, I think what Trump did um, or has done has been 
devastating. And, and no, no matter where you are in the political spectrum, I mean, it's not the, the country is not better than it was when, you know, four years sure. ago. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if Biden's going to do a better job, um, but it's definitely a breath of fresh air to, to kind of have a new start. Yeah, you know? I, I think so. Yeah, I'm open to all of it at this point, but uh, it's a very painful. It's been a very painful uh, last few years to watch, you know, you know, especially when you've served with white America. I've served with them. I know, you know, what that world feels like. Right. I can. I understand they're good people, too. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think they're just being taken over by propaganda. And who knows where all of this stuff is coming from, you know. Is it coming from Russia? Is it coming from China? Is it coming from bots? Who knows what kind of conspiracy any of this stuff is coming from? But what I do know is what I'm seeing is white America is really not comfortable with, I think, the minorities and blacks and BLM movements. And it's terror. It's being torn up. But maybe this is a good thing. Maybe the debate, maybe the the action from you know the minorities and and, and the different communities debating and, and young people engaging in politics is a very good thing. You got to rip yeah. things open to, to 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 heal things. But I'm you know I'm no um, political junkie like my brother. You know, Tom is reads about this stuff eight hours it's like his full-time job almost you know makes you wonder how he can run these companies but i'm not gonna i'm not going to um i'm not going to co comment confidently because i'm not as uh you know well read as 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 he is and i and i know you know he and a few of my friends are just so into those into that world that you know that they can make these um but then again you know it's like if you can't see left or right, uh, if you if you can't see the other person's point of view, then we're all failing, right? Right. What's the point of this all? You know, like it's always like boot on everybody's neck. You know, I feel like it's like the right has the boot on the left's neck and vice versa, and, and nothing's. Sometimes I feel like nothing. I'm sure things are happening and progressing. Things are getting better, but. It just feels like it's just we're we're living in a a world of confusion here in the U.S. How do you feel about all of it? I think you know I'm still very interested in what happens in the U.S. I mean, it's, it's my it's really my country to be honest. Yeah. Um, the past several years. That this veneer of exceptionalism has um, eroded. I know it's so thin and like like an illusion. Vietnam's always uh, the United States has always been good on its soft power through culture and Hollywood and things, but I think particularly after this pandemic, some people have a lot of sympathy for America, but I. I don't think I have sympathy. I, I think I am somewhere between rage and mm -hmm. concern. But for sure, the beautiful dream of America has certainly evaporated for people that wanted to partake, partake in that dream. Um, they're reconsidering, I think. Yeah. Um, the last time I was back in America um, was last year for the virus spread. And I was in Worcester in Massachusetts and I really felt that I didn't belong mm -hmm. in America any longer. Not that someone was pushing me away, but I just felt like there was nothing there for me, really. Um, Disconnected. That could change. Yeah, that could change. I love American culture, for example. I love country music, for example. Something very unique. Uh, um, I do too. I went to Gar see Garth Brooks and, uh, yeah, been to a few country concerts. And I was like the only Asian in the 90s to go to a 
Yeah, and it yeah, you're right. It's special. If I wasn't phenotypically you know, Asian, I'd be like a hillbilly <laughs> for sure. I mean, my mom's born in Appalachia. Wow, she's from West Virginia, West Virginia, mm-hmm. sort of like coal mining kind of yeah ancestry. So that's like the poorest of the poor people in America. Yeah, so poor that some people say West Virginia is that the western part of Virginia? <laughs> it's a real state. Um, yeah, um, and my dad was a a long time a rancher a cowboy in Wyoming. So wow. all of this really not even working class, but just if there's any culture that I feel like I really know well, it's poor white people. Ironically, that's my upbringing: mm. poor and white, but not really white. Um, so when Trump won. I wasn't devastated. I thought I'd give him a chance. Um, if anything, it'd be interesting to see how an outsider could do something. Yeah. You know, I think we all kind of thought that. I thought that. And, um, and, and maybe I had a little, you know, kind of personal delight in seeing certain firmly established structures fall. You know, sort of like it, let's raise it and new sprouts. But um, very quickly, that changed to just being somebody that would check the news every day, like looking at a road crash. Yeah, and just seeing what, what was new to kind of. You know, and he could have he could have done so much better. You know, um, he really could have. I think there was a few clicks to the left. Of, to the right of his brain on a psychological level that Mary Trump, which is uh, his niece. I, I think that's her name, right? That the, the niece. Yeah. So, both the book. Uh, yeah, I wrote the book. I, I read her book and it's very telling cause she's, you know, a psychologist or psychotherapist and she kind of analyzes and breaks down his upbringing with Fred senior uh, Trump's mm-hmm. father. And you realize the kind of like the crippling, effects of abuse of um Mm -hmm. the way that trump's dad carried on with entitling him and allowing Mm -hmm. him to slip through the cracks with certain things and it all shows up in the way he's led the his administration and i think that if we don't take the time to kind of like think about a person's psychology and where they come from, um, we can easily point the finger. I mean, he's a monster if you if you stand back and, and just kind of watch what he's done. But on a deeper level, you could see the little boy, the fear, the, the absolute fear that this little boy, he's never grown up from a six-year-old kid, um, the way Mary Trump is explaining in, in the book. Mm-hmm. And it's very apparent the way uh, she, you know, her thesis on on her uncle is, very clear that he's still finding approval from his father and that's it everything he does is a is seeking approval from fred senior and uh it's just devoured it just it just has killed the country um just seeped into every part of the government and um i don't think the democracy is ever going to be the same yeah, I think I think we really need, I don't know if ever an amendment to the Constitution would be passed, but we seriously need to reconsider the Electoral College yeah. um, to be more representative of people, to be honest. Um, yeah, I mean, how, how difficult would it be, we bank online, we do so many things online, how difficult would it be to just do a verification, identity verification, and we vote on our phones? Mm-hmm. And then it's take away the electorate, electoral and just institute vote by phone. We can ident- you know, we can do some identity um, confirmations and then we just let it roll. And then we're going to really see sort of who um, who should be in that that seat. Right. I think I don't know if that's going to work or not. On one hand, we have sort of a tyranny by the minority. 
with the Electoral College. But on the other hand, if we just went straight to a direct vote, the coastal cities and their would populations dom- would dominate the whole country. Dominate. Yeah. And nothing would happen as far as infrastructure and Very true. to the middle country. So I don't have an answer. I'm not, I, I didn't put a lot of brain juice on it, but there needs to be something that, I, that emerges that is really representative of the entire nation in its diversity. Um, I don't know what that would be, though. So how do you feel about the next decade living in Vietnam? Like, what do you, what's your trajectory? Do you think about it? You, are you hopeful? Are you... Um, I'm hopeful. The city, Vietnam's really um, done really good for itself, given it only opened up to the world in 95. Uh, they're invested in being, you know, a globally integrated, connected nation. Uh, there's certainly things to worry about, such as climate change, yeah, saltwater intrusion, land erosion, all kinds of things, flooding. Uh, um, Do you? But I um, think. I'm sorry. Go ahead. But, you think what? But particularly after COVID, I think I have a lot more confidence in this country. That's great to hear. Do you find yourself? As a as an artist, part of the story of Vietnam, or do you find yourself more of a global voice? Uh, where I think I'm probably more global. I'm not, like I said, I'm not really speaking about autobiographical issues, but I'm not really speaking about Vietnamese essentialism, for example. Like, what is Vietnamese, basically, and then in turn, what is it to me, or how do I alter that, or I always stayed away from those a lot of Vietnamese specific issues also because maybe inside I I felt like I wasn't entitled to talk about those things. Mm. Not being fluent in Vietnamese, but also not having shared experience. I think it's more that the if I did something wrong there wrong that the government thought was wrong i'd be just deported but it's likely for a co- artwork or something like that i'm not going to be jailed or i'm not going to be harassed um so maybe for me speaking on those things with compared to other vietnamese artists that have much more risk yeah i, I don't know i wouldn't call it disingenuous but Maybe I am saying that, that I didn't feel like I was the one to comment on issues that I didn't have a lot of stake or personal risk at addressing. And then again, I've been more consider- interested in other issues, such as intersections in art and science or, yeah. Generally, I don't really talk about Vietnam directly through the artwork. When you um, are, as you're living in Vietnam, do you ever go watch movies or consume music or anything uh, Vietnamese as you're living in country? I'm doing it more now, um, mostly through television or listening to the radio I mean, because my, my proficiency is getting better. My ears are getting better. So I, I, I'm actually able to get something out of um, and, accessing and Vietnamese. And you're married to a Vietnamese woman, right? Yes. Yes, and so that's so that's it's all it, it's always around the house. Um, yeah. I just need to really practice my speaking much more conversational. Reading's quite good now. Um, writing's pretty shabby. Spoken is getting better, but I still have, and I have natural flow. You know, I'm more like stuttered. Yeah. Um, yeah. But for everyday living, I'm fine. But but I'm tasked now for being able within within the next year maybe teaching Vietnamese, which is wow is a pure battle i don't i don't think uh i'll be able to do it within a year but the goal is living here to do as much as i can to speak Vietnamese. here's what we're going to do in two years mm-hmm. from today we're going to do a podcast entirely in vietnamese 
Okay. Let's try it. <laughs> Can you imagine? I, 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 I like the heat. I'm like, I, I, I'm a procrastinator and I work best, you know, when the deadline's like really at, at my neck. Um, so I need, I, I also entered this Vietnamese degree program also because I wanted to um, be able to speak Vietnamese with, with my so, children. So wait, you're, the, you said a Vietnamese degree, which is what, Vietnamese language? No, it's, I'm taking an, a master's degree in um, industrial design. Okay. Got it. Um, at a Vietnamese college, university. In, entirely in Vietnamese. It's all in Vietnamese. Um, so in class, I probably get about 20 to 25% of wow. spoken. I bring the PowerPoints home. I translate them at night. Um, but it's getting better because I'm in, in Vietnamese class five days a week in the morning. You know, pretty intense. Um, so in order to meet a don't need a, this degree, I, I'm going to need also the certification for Vietnamese. So basically, it's like um, uh, second English for second language uh, learner in in America that needs to get a minimum score on the TOEFL or the IELTS. I got to meet that minimum score. I don't get my degree. I bow down to you, man. That is not it's an hard. easy thing, and it's I hard can't... because I'm almost 50, 50 years old. That that natural innate ability to kind of retain that brain elasticity yeah. is not there anymore. Um, so it's it's really trying, but I'm happy to do it. I think yeah. if anything, it's sort of like um, using parts of your brain that would otherwise atrophy, and that keeps you yeah. staving off Alzheimer's. You know, Absolutely. practice drawing with your left hand, even though it looks crappy. Yeah. Just the fact that you're kind of working on opposite sides of your brain should keep you a little more fit. And that's, and that's sort of like what, how I feel like I approach raising my children. It's like, mm. you, you just do by, you lead by example. I mean, it's hard. Mm. That kind of stuff is yeah. hard. Like getting a master's in Vietnamese at your age and yeah. your kids have to look at it and, 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 and feel the heat too. You know, it's like, you don't have to say anything. It's like, bitch, I got my master's yeah. in Vietnamese, you know, at, at 50. And it's like, you have no excuse, you know? And I think as well, American, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that to them. Um, <laughs> just like, this is the bar you need to set. Um, yeah. You know, I really want to give them their own sort of agency to do whatever they do. I think my, my main thing is to provide them comfort with yeah. some security. Um, as they grow, and then just do what you want to do. You I don't even know. Be I, gender. I don't even know about comfort and security. I think you should take. I take. I take that away too if I could. You know, because <laughs> it's it's sort of like the more they struggle, the I mean, unfortunately, they're gonna we're gonna try. I, I mean, it's encoded in our DNA as parents to to give them as much as we can. But I mean, I've watched. Uh, my cousins who were, you know, given nothing, my older cousins who were like in camps for in transition from, from, from being boat people, then they were in Guam or Thailand. And yeah, several of these cousins, when they got here, they just, they just took off and they didn't have parents. They didn't have any supervision. They just knew that they were given this one shot and they didn't have parents. And then meanwhile, you look at Tom and I, we we're like spoiled, you know, until we got into the Marine Corps, you know, but I think we could have, we, I, and we definitely, I think subconscious did learn from their struggles and, you know, they didn't have a safety net. And I look back at my kids sometimes. I'm like, I am trying to, you know, I talked to my wife about this. We, I would love to give them that experience of like feeling no safety net, feeling mm -hmm. like, Hey, we got to bounce. Like, uh war is coming we like now we're taking off we got to go to another country and deal with it you're going to deal with learning a new language you're going to deal with making new friends and that kind of shock to the system i think creates mm -hmm. this a different awareness that uh, i think we probably weren't are not going to give our children <laughs> it's hard it's hard to give our children that yeah but they'll figure it out Either way, um, just like we did. Yeah. Um, and hopefully it makes them more empathetic people. Yeah. 
kind people. That's the most important thing, I think. Mm. Yeah, the most important is to raise kind and empathetic people. Well, Rich, I really appreciate the time um, spending it with you today, and thank you for this opportunity to really sit and, and talk and. I hope it's not two years, but I hope it's in a year that we can get back uh, on another um, episode and and Absolutely. and talk and um, bust in and out of Vietnamese and English and Vietnamese. Sure. When do you think you'll be back next? Uh, of course, uh, as, know, soon, as soon as they lift the the travel restrictions, you know, mm. uh, I have business that we need to tend to and uh, love to I, see my brother it, and. Long. Uh, Dong Nai. Long Khan. Uh, so, yeah, it's on the way to Dong Nai. Uh, it's a small yeah. town on the way to uh, to Dong Nai. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I miss Vietnam dearly, and I think about it almost every day. Um, how much I miss it, but I also miss Taiwan. You know, traveling to Taiwan because right. I always go through Taiwan and I spend a few days, and sometimes I meet with my wife's parents and. Mm -hmm. Or meet with factories, and then I'll go on to to Vietnam. But uh, I miss that whole, you know, traveling three or four times a year to, yeah. to Asia. Yeah, it's very yeah. much a part of who we are, right? Like, I always, I always catch you by surprise when you're at your yeah. brother's house, and you're here. How long? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've never had a really uh, a chance to to do this, but I hope this um, way. I mean, thank God for technology now that we can do this and get to know the world can get to know more of what you do. And, and I'm, I've always been interested. I just never had a real opportunity to sit and to spend this much time talking about what yeah. you do, you know, and I feel like we've just really scratched the surface today just to get to know you. But yeah. what, what I what intend to do is build a, a big fat library of people like you coming on multiple times. Um, and then the, the world can see your evolution as a as a an artist as a person and yeah i didn't really give you a sense of more of the art maybe i, I maybe as much as i or you had intended no but i'm what, not to be what, uh, whatever more, we, go ahead i'm sorry no no it's just just uh, us chit-chatting and kind of establishing a rapport yeah and i think that's more important than you know getting into that yeah, because that's what is sort of like the zeitgeist of what is on our minds, right? And I, I feel like we just should, on all of these episodes, I feel like I just should go where the guest goes. And mm. if they're going to reappear, we'll get to see more of their personality and more of their work and talk more about that. But I think the foundational, you know, we talked a lot about politics and, and, and culture um, as it relates to us being, you know, Americans today. But I think on, you know, future episodes, we can talk about the art or your experience. And, you know, I wanted sure. to really talk about your teaching experience with, with um, the youth in Vietnam, but that's all fine. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to all of that eventually. And uh, I want to do much, much more with you. You miss baseball. Say again? You miss baseball. Baseball? Uh, baseball? Uh, yeah, baseball. Oh, like baseball. American Sorry. I, baseball. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, last time I was in America, I brought a, a glove and a ball over for my son when he grows mm. up. Like, it's useless here. Like, there's no, there's no diamonds. Or, that yeah. was something that you know, with you know, other people had their favorite sports. Yeah, but um, that's one thing I miss. Is baseball, baseball games. Yeah. Tom and I didn't grow up with sports, so we we don't have any of that sort of nostalgic, yeah. um, like other friends of ours, like Qua and you know these guys. Qua well, loves football. Well, love football, yeah. A lot of my friends love football, and I, Tom and I don't. I, I, I gravitate towards MMA, and and and. Oh, I love MMA. Love it too. I watch everything. Bellator, one. <laughs> I, I'm not going to tell you how I watch it in Vietnam, but <laughs> all, all of them. See, weekend. and this is let's talk a little bit MMA before we close out. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure, sure. I would. Okay, so Tom hates it. Tom hates what? Really? Life. Oh, you, you haven't oh, talked about Oh, yeah, it. yeah. He doesn't like violence. Right, he right. hates it. He hates watching it. He hates poor folks training their entire lives to be a gladiator in, in yeah. this. <sighs> but I don't feel that way at all. I think it's good. Uh, I think it's good for you. I think, you know, that kind of 
you know, training is, I, I would love for my daughter, you know, to, to, to train in, 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 in some fight sport, her mother, uh, my wife has a black belt in Taekwondo. I think it's important, you know, and I think being in the military, we kind of like, you know, had some combat hand to hand training uh, very superficially, but I believe in it. I believe, and I've never gotten to a fight uh, in my yeah. life. Never had to uh, just uh, resolved everything with my words, but certainly watching this stuff is sort of like, uh, this is when it gets debatable. It's like when you watch it and then you get riled up by it, but the training side of it and learning about it is one thing, right? Like you go to the dojo or you go to the gym and you learn and you train and it's beneficial, but to do it as a spectator sport. Yeah. I, I kind of can understand where my brother's coming from on that. How do you feel about that? Well, I'm such a fan. I mean, to be objective, I don't really have any personal issues if you ask me. <laughs> um, if they're being exploited, I mean, I, I think on the smaller circuits, certainly you don't make a lot of money yeah. and take a lot of damage. But that as a platform, it, it does allow very quick upward mobility. Same as artists. I mean, yeah. you know, if, if they wanted to be, if you grew up in like an immigrant community, rather poor, if you took a very traditional ways of like becoming a doctor or a lawyer, there's a very, there's a, the path is already there. And you just have to kind of meet all those benchmarks to be there. There's no shortcut. You can't shortcut being a doctor, right? Though through other professions, there are shortcuts. If you either have the drive or the aptitude. And MMA is probably like that too. Yeah. But you either have the talent or you just have, are a very hard worker that you could get somewhere pretty fast, relatively. Um, is anything really non-exploitative in, in yeah, capitalist society? Right. Not really. Um, yeah, I don't have any issues with it at the moment. I think probably fighters could have more equity um, and more say into the terms under which they fight. Um, yeah, I, I really don't have I informed. I did one episode with uh, our first cousin, uh, Andy Wynn. She's a, a pro MMA fighter. Um, Tom and I have a cousin, first cousin. From oh, he showed, Tom showed me a picture before. Yeah, and she I did an, ep back. did an episode with her. So I will have that posted next year when we release uh, nice. Yeah, these episodes. But uh, very, um, very interesting life that she lives, you know. Um, and, and, you know, people who get there, I think, have a special journey as well because they have this, like, this fire, this rage, this, uh, this thirst to train and to be in the ring and to engage into – it's a mm. life and death thing. Right. And there's art to that. I mean, if you think about it, it's like there's a, a, an expression to that that's beautiful too. I think so. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen. And did you just see Tyson fight? I did. Did you watch, watch that? that? Yeah, I did watch That's that. Pretty impressive. I, it, it, yeah, I mean, at, at 54, it's yeah. just his body is like immaculate. Yeah. Right. But, but even beyond that, too, the humanity of Tyson and um, Roy Jones, when they get back, uh, they, they, you know, they do the debriefing, the, the, the cameras, you know, interview both of them. And the love, the respect, the... Just because you you remember like when he bit off uh, uh, Holyfield's yeah. ear, and then you go you think about that, and then you think about how much he's evolved um, now, and what comes out of his mouth now is so different as a human. And we mm. there's that evolutionary kind of like that journey for for Tyson, and yeah. um, it's just yeah, it was really nice to watch. But one thing yeah, I didn't like was more redeemed yeah. in this part. Sort of the inverse of Cosby. Totally. Totally. He's very redeemed. And the fact that he's fighting for charity, too. Yeah. You know, it's a great humanitarian cause uh, that, that the two of them engaged in. It's just beautiful to watch him train. But one thing I didn't like was the fact that they didn't just, like, it couldn't really go all out. 
you know, yeah, they, they weren't. Going and that to draw, play. and being a draw was just bullshit. Yes, um, but that was like kind of preordained, yeah. pre-agreed upon, right? Like they wouldn't. Um, there's not. I don't. Did they score it? I'm not. Yeah, I don't know if judges but scored it. As an exhibition match, this isn't an official match as far as it goes on the record, is it? Right. No, no, I don't think it is. Yeah. No, no. I mean, and neither one of those guys probably care. Yeah. You know? yeah. Speaking of which, I would love to see um, the Viet. Nam fight scene develop. You know, I, I want to get some guys on. You know, well, one guys. one's been here. One championship's been here once, I think. Oh, um, really? And then Kobe came around, and they, yeah. they they couldn't do it any longer. I think there's a thing um, called but, the Saigon Training Center. Is that the big hmm. MMA gym in in Vietnam? Yeah, but UFC gym. They probably just I, I, there's one one gym called the UFC gym in District Two, they, and they totally scalped the logo and everything yeah. else i mean it's problematic i think with intellectual property rights but, yeah but one ufc gym um <laughs> that a lot of people train out just two the bjj and a number of other yeah striking courses. um i think there's we're seeing some some vietnamese fighters now um enter those those org- fighting organizations um i don't know Asians generally haven't been very successful, largely. Largely, yeah. You got Martin Wynn out of Australia. Yep. Yeah, he's pretty well, badass. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's another. There's another wing in in. I think it's one championship, but he's even he's American. Mm, new guy. He's been, he's been pretty good. And then there's like Zhang Weili, who's just a beast. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see that? What fight with Joanna Mirjechik? No, I haven't. I haven't uh, seen that yet. Uh, it was one of the best fights of last year, um, but we'll see. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm a total fan. I'm, I'm probably not a big as big a fan as you, but I definitely love to talk about it and watch. You know, I love it. Right. I love to to to. I I don't miss the UFC fights. Yeah. Uh, this is awesome, Rich. I didn't. I had no idea. Yeah, let's let's chit chat some more, and um, hopefully, I can give you more information next time. Um, no, if this you is, want any specific information, the, go in, in more detail or something. This is like perfect. No, this is perfect, and you know what? Better way for the world, you know, um, to get to know you, and and you know, because you know, here's the thing about these podcasts. What I've learned is this: we, I've done a lot of them, and it's not like we ever talk about the work. You know, I mm. think. Talking about the work is maybe ten percent of the fascination with the with the person behind the work, right? Ninety percent of the beauty of this long form stuff is getting to know the human being behind all of that other stuff. You know, I totally agree. Otherwise, it's just like a, a press statement, a press release. Exactly, and this is not what this That's is like, about. You know, plugging your movie on Letterman or something. Totally, totally. This is a. You know, I, I really am grateful that we have this sort of technology and this sort of like idea of a long form podcast, you know, to really get to know um, each other and for the world to kind of discover what really goes on behind the thinking. So when kids in Vietnam are seeing you or your work at an exhibition, they can go back online and they, they can sit and hear the 90% yeah. of things that are happening in your world and your life at that time, you know, in 2020, December 5th, you know, and they, they can go back and go, that's what that artist was like at that moment in time. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, right. you know, that, that's important to me. And I'd like to keep doing uh, more people in the Vietnamese world and, and really kind of getting this sort of out there and people getting to know the artists and the, and the craftsmen and the craftspeople, mm. craftswomen that are involved in making these wonderful things that we get to experience as we live here on earth. If I have any suggestions, I'll send them to you as well. There's, there's some interesting people here in different industries. I, from fashion I, would, to- I was going to ask you that right after we end the call, but that's, oh, cool. I would love to talk about that. Yeah, happy to do that. Rich, thank you so much. Um, again, we'll probably be reconnecting next year sometime, and uh, we'll do this again, and we'll we'll go along again, and we'll you know get down to uh, get down to more stuff. 
Awesome. Hopefully it'll be in Vietnam. Please see you there.